coming up this week on the center of it all. Summer hiking with your pet is a favorite hobby for most people. We talked to a few local veterinarians about some things you should know before you go into the wilderness. And a local gym is opening a new location for a unique kind of workout. Mel is in the kitchen and we show you some downside effects of too much social media. Don't go anywhere, it's all right here on the center of it all. Welcome to the center of it all, May and a time for Mother's Day. Now, when you go hiking, you pack a backpack for yourself, but have you ever thought about your pet? We talked to a few local veterinarians about a few things you may want to have on hand. I think it's really important to get outside and get some exercise with your pets. It's good for people, it's good for pets. And I wanted people to have some tools so that they can have fun, um, but do so safely and avoid some common emergencies that I see in my profession. Uh, minor lacerations, sprain strains, um, heat exhaustion and dehydration are pretty big concerns too. The best thing that you could do is actually monitor your animal. Watch, watch for panting that's uncontrolled, that they you know, seem to be panting on, um, very heavily. If they are slowing down, um, Watch for them to show signs of being tired, sitting down, not really wanting to continue to pursue. Um, instead of being interested in their surroundings, they start to um, stand uh, exclusively by you and walk with you instead of adventuring out and, and being interested in things. If they seem at all weak, you need to give your pet a break, get them some water. Um, and if they're not recovering, that's a time to seek veterinary care. Those are all signs that an animal's tired and maybe overheating as well. For most pets, getting them a drink, giving them a chance to rest and calling it a day, they're probably going to be fine. Uh, there's three main vaccines um, uh, that when we're talking about dogs that we worry about uh, prior to any time that they're out in public. The first would be the rabies vaccine, which is required by state law. Um, that is definitely something that in the wild uh, you're going to encounter you know, some type of animal that could have rabies, any mammal could have rabies. So uh, having that rabies vaccine is definitely protective and necessary. The other two vaccines aren't required by law, but they're definitely recommended. Uh, the first would be the uh, what's commonly called the distemper vaccine, which is actually a combination of four to five diseases that are in one vaccination. Uh, and the other one is the Lyme vaccine. Uh, Lyme disease is relatively prevalent in this area, uh, so we are recommending most dogs that go outside have the Lyme disease vaccine as well. There is a vaccine actually for rattlesnake bites. So having a vaccination for rattlesnakes is something that if you're aware that rattlesnakes are in that area, your pet should have. If your pet is the type to go after porcupines, you may want to consider keeping them on a leash especially spring and fall when they're more active. Whether it be bee stings or uh, porcupine quills or uh, cuts uh, from running through things, uh, having a small first aid kit is not a bad idea um, so that you can clean a wound, um, you know, a little bit of uh, antibacterial soap, uh, some uh, little gauze to stop bleeding, those types of things can often be helpful. Carry Benadryl. Um, you don't have to, but if your pet comes in contact with um, a bee or um, a plant that it is slightly allergic to, you know, you may have swelling in hives, those types of things. Benadryl can help to reduce that. Now, your veterinarian has to tell you the dose and has to tell you if it's okay technically. You have seen your primary care vet, get your pet in for a checkup and talk about what your pet needs based on their risk level. Probably the most important thing, especially over the summer, to take with you is extra water for your pet. Um, dehydration, heat stress can set in pretty quickly and your pet may not tell you some of the early warning signs. You know, don't underestimate your dog's needs for water. Um, oftentimes, um, folks don't drink much themselves, so they assume their pet doesn't need the, doesn't need the water otherwise, but it, it absolutely, your pet needs more water than you do. Animals that are experienced hikers that go out frequently, less breaks are necessary. Um, 
the animals that are just starting, you know, giving breaks every 20 to 30 minutes so that you can ensure that the pet isn't becoming overheated and that they're getting what they need um, would be the best way to approach it. What kind of conditions you're in, especially heat, humidity, um, and other things like your pet's age and just how used to outdoor activity they are. Keeping them on a leash is always safer. Now, honestly, everyone knows their pet better than we would at this point. And, you know, if an owner feels comfortable taking them off a leash, if they know their surroundings, if they have good control, that's a decision that they can make. But if you're anywhere near a road, or if you're in an environment that you don't know, like it could be different wildlife there, the leash is always safer. So leashes can protect your pet and protect other animals and people around you just depending on your dog's personality and what they're used to. It's important to know leash laws with the area that you're in. Both doctors stress to talk to your veterinarian before giving your pet any medications. When we come back, we leave on our hiking sneakers and head into the gym. Welcome back. Do you have a busy schedule and you feel like you just don't have the time to work out? One local gym is hoping to change that in the beginning of June. It started out as an empty room that needed a coat or two of paint. But what it will be is a room full of people coming together for one thing, fitness. Victory, a local gym in State College, is expanding their services to Belfont. At 102 East, Victory is offering a place for people to get involved with their boot camp classes. Don't know what boot camp classes are? Empower will be boot camp fitness classes, um, which are basically body weight exercises using um, various pieces of equipment being dumbbells, kettlebells, med balls, resistance bands, those types of things, not big pieces of machinery. All the equipment will be provided for you, you just need to show up ready to work. These classes are a little different because there's no big machinery when it comes to the workout and it's done in a shorter amount of time. The ability for someone to come and get a full body workout in a short amount of time, you know, whether it be the half hour early in the morning before work or you know, before they send their kids off to school or go about their day or the hour long class before work or after work or after school or you know, whatever would work for most people. So you're busy and don't feel like you have time to hit the gym. That's why these classes work so well. They get you in for your workout and right back out the door so you can get to your next appointment. So when are these classes scheduled to take place? So Monday through Friday, we're gonna offer what's called an express class. So that's gonna be from 5.30 in the morning to six. And then we're gonna offer an hour long class from six to seven in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we're gonna offer two one hour classes. So it'll be 3.45 to 4.45 and 5.30 to 6.30. And then we're gonna offer two classes on Saturday mornings as well. Because Victory is a small family owned gym out of State College, it gives them a more personal touch to their clients. And that personality is something they pride themselves in. Since we are just a small business, uh, mom and pop shop, we are very customer oriented and we strive to have good customer service as well as serving as many people as we can um, and just impacting their lives as a whole. I would definitely say customer service. That's our number one priority. Um, you know, being there, getting to know people, helping them, empowering them to, to you know, we are hoping to empower people in their fitness journey and give them another opportunity to do that. Victory is warmly welcomed in the State College community and because of that, they wanted to branch out and extend their services to people in other locations and give them the same opportunity that State College has. Really not anything around here that offers boot camp fitness. Um, there is the YMCA, um, but beyond that, we don't really have anything in town. So we're just trying to expand into another location and have what we offer. Currently, Victory Sports is in State College and we've had a lot of success there and we're looking to branch out, you know, kind of get the roots into another community. We're excited about the opportunity. Paint dried and the plants planted, they prepare for their opening day on June 2nd. For more information, visit Victory's Facebook page at Empire Boot Camp Fitness. When we come back, Mel takes two recipes and mixes them into one. Welcome back to the center of it all, chili and mac and cheese. Need I say more? Take it away, Mel. As a mother of three grown boys, 
I know a thing or two about making chili and macaroni and cheese. I know I made a lot of both for a lot of years and often. I also know my boys loved it when I made both and mixed them together. Join me right here at the stovetop today while I show you how to make my kid-tested, mother-approved Chili Mac. Chili Mac arrived in the American marketplace in the form of Hamburger Helper in 1971. It was really popular, but the thought of a box of dried pasta, powdered sauce mix, and seasonings didn't really excite me or my family. That said, my boys loved Wendy's chili and Kraft macaroni and cheese. So I simply set out to make my own copycat versions of both. And to this day, I wouldn't change a thing. I've got about two and a half pounds of really lean ground beef. I'm using 90-10 in a wide bottom, uh, wide bottom four quart stock pot. And I'm gonna season it with about a teaspoon of salt, teaspoon of black pepper, and two teaspoons of garlic powder. I'm going to add about a cup, cup and a half of chopped onion. The same of green bell pepper. And the same, a cup, cup and a half of red bell pepper. If you don't like any one of these things, just make up the difference with something else. Like you could put extra onion and skip bell peppers, whatever you like to do. I'm gonna put this on medium high heat. And I'm gonna keep stirring it around and I'm gonna saute this for about 15 minutes till the meat is cooked through, the vegetables are cooked through. It's reduced in volume by about a half and there's almost no liquid left in the bottom of the pan. It's been about 20 minutes. Everything is cooked through camera, if I don't know if you can get in here, there's almost no liquid left in the bottom of the pan, which is exactly what we want. So now I'm going to add a few more spices into this mix. And I'm going with Mexican oregano, cumin, more black pepper, and Mexican chili powder. I'm going to give that a really good stir. And now we're going to add our tomato -y ingredients. I'm using a 14 and a half ounce can of plain tomato sauce. A 14 and a half ounce can of undrained diced tomatoes, because I like some chunky tomatoes in there. And thanks to the genius of our middle son, he asked me to start adding a jar of his favorite Tostitos salsa. And that's just full of all sorts of good flavor. So we'll get this simmering, get it stirred in really good to get all the spices in through all the tomatoey stuff. And now our beans. And I like a lot of them. You can you know, you can add a smaller can if you want. I like red kidney beans. So I'm just going to add, and these are well drained. You don't want to add any more juice to this. That is perfect. Oh, a couple more. All right, here we go. I'll stir all of these in. And I'm going to let this simmer for about 30 to 35 minutes. And I am gonna tell you that this is going to make four quarts of chili. And what I do when I'm making chili mac is I freeze three quarts and I use one quart to stir in to my macaroni and cheese mixture. While my chili was simmering on the back of the stove, I took a couple of minutes to cook and drain a pound of pasta. And please use tubular pasta, penne, uh, uh, anything that's got tubes in it. I use some pretty little cavatelli today because I like these spirals. I think they're kind of cute. And after I drained it, I tossed it with four ounces of butter. That's four tablespoons of butter. And I added two teaspoons of garlic powder to it. In the meantime, 
in my microwave, I melted one jar of Cheese Whiz. Yes, Kraft Cheese Whiz, in my opinion, makes the best imitation or copycat recipe of Kraft macaroni and cheese. As I was just telling Adam, my camera guy today, one pound of pasta, four ounces of butter, two teaspoons of garlic powder, and a jar of Cheese Whiz. Best copycat Kraft macaroni and cheese. Okay, that's all in there. Turn this down because just want it on real, real low heat. Let's just melt this in. Into the still warm pasta. It won't take very long. Oh. And one of the reasons you don't add any salt to any of this is because your cheese whiz is really going to make this, a, it's going to salt the pasta plenty. Now in case you don't believe me, you have to just at some point take a taste. Oh yeah. Okay, now comes the fun part. We're going to stir in one quart of chili. This is one quart, which I've measured out, hot off the stove. Let's get this all stirred in. And it is time to head over to the counter and serve our chili mac. Take a tip from a well-seasoned mom and grandmother like me. Cooking for kids is never easy, but it can be fun. Knowing how to cook a few uncomplicated recipes that they like, using a little bit of meat, some fresh chopped vegetables, and a few pantry ingredients goes a long way, and it's a smart way, to show your kids that eating at the kitchen counter is a lot better than spending time at the takeout counter. For these and all of my recipes, just go to my website. Let us know what some of your favorite meal combinations are on our Facebook page. When we come back, we take a look at the app of the week and show you how too much social media can actually hurt your social life. Welcome back. Now for some, running outside is more enjoyable than going to the gym. We take a look at an app that makes running anywhere at any time easier than ever. It's called Run Go, and it makes finding running routes in your area and creating them easy. When you open the app, you can see routes in your area that people have already created and added to the app. It tells you where the route is, how long, and you can download it before you leave so you can run the route without using your data. The app has points along the way that tells you where to turn, onto what street, and points out scenic views that you'll enjoy along the way. You can set the app to talk over top of your music so you can have both on while you run. You can also create your own route, though to do this you will need to create an account. The app will also track your stats, like time, pace, distance, and elevation. And when you travel out of your normal area, you can still get your exercise. The app has a variety of worldwide routes logged and has live tracking so you can let your friends and family track your run or races in real time for that extra safety feature. And once you have completed a run, you can save it into your logbook for future reference. And if you have an Apple Watch, you can use the app from your wrist if you don't feel like carrying your phone on your run. You can also pause or stop the route at any time along the way with a simple click. That way, if you need to stop because of rain or just to take a break, it won't ruin your running stats. And if you want to go a step above what the free download has to offer, there is a variety of subscription prices available so you can test out the app's other features to see if it is a good fit for you. Once you come in from a run, a lot of people post or jump onto social media. And lately, it is everywhere we look, and access is easier than ever. But how much is too much? People who are already kind of socially isolated 
got even more isolated because they used it as a substitute for social contact. So if they were uncomfortable being in social situations, they didn't have to be, and so they were even more isolated. The study looked at 1,700 people between the ages of 19 and 32. Researchers found that those who spent the most time on social media had the highest likelihood of feeling socially isolated. Dr. Rock said the surprising finding from the study was that even people who were not socially isolated to begin with had the tendency to back off social contact when they engaged in more social media use. He says that it's easy to lose sight of the fact that what we see on social media doesn't tell the whole story. It's a narrative that people have created and it's full of edits. Dr. Rock said it can be an even bigger issue for folks who struggle with social anxiety because it doesn't give them the practice they need and can keep them from learning to be around people. He says one of the best ways to escape the social media rut is to try out reality instead. There's a reason this stuff is called virtual reality. It means it's not quite reality. And I think just is getting out there and getting a sense of what's really going on. And when you talk to an actual human being for a period of time, you're going to get a more balanced picture of what's really going on with them. Dr. Ock says that if you just look at it every once in a while, it's not a big deal. But if you start getting angry or change your social habits because of it, then it's time to take a step back. That wraps up this week's Center of It All. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to check our Facebook page for any episodes you may have missed. Enjoy the rest of your week, and I'll see you next time.